Hey, I'm Shy Fox, and I'm going to show you how I color skin for my semi-realistic anime art style. I will be showing you most of the creation process and slow down during the skin painting parts and explain what I did at each stage. In this video, I hope to teach you things that will take painting skin from looking basic and flat to having that sense of depth and realism. I'm self-taught artist and believe that anyone who puts in the time and effort into learning and practicing will see great improvements. And while you're here, like and subscribe to see more digital art tutorials from me and future ones that I'm going to add to my channel. So the very first thing I do is, of course, after the sketch, I start putting down flat color and do my layer organization. So the sketch is above and these flat colored layers go underneath. The face skin layer goes on its own layer and the neck is on its own layer and the hand is on its own layer and I just color them separately. Very important too is I have a reference to imitate the shadows and lighting that I want to aim for and it's best to have one main reference and then have other references for some extra information, some supporting references. It is really important to choose a really good main reference to work from. The next thing I do is add gradient shading with an airbrush and I find the airbrush is a fantastic tool just to add in those soft shading areas and give that sense of general lighting and in this case we have darker shadows from the forehead downward. And then I'm also airbrushing in softly just some of the shadows on that right side of the face. I like to then color my sketch layer with a brownish red over the skin parts. And then ultimately what I do is I copy out these sections and paste them onto like the face layer, the neck layer, and the hand layer, and just merge the sketch in that way and actually erase from the original sketch layer. And this way I'm able to take the sketch parts and just have them separated onto each of the layers that they're actually going to end up belonging to and keep that layer separation. Then I like to block in the hard shadows using a brush tool and it's important to have those hard edges. We have some soft ones, now we need to add in some harder edges and uh, building up those shadows, starting to really build up darker shadows and not being too afraid to put in like a lot darker colors. And these are the starting point for the shadows of our face really, and they don't need to be perfect. I'm just looking at my reference and trying to generally get the concept of the main bulk shadows down. As a basic rule with semi-realistic semi-realism art, it is important to have hard edged shadows as well as soft edged shadows. That combination is really the key to your shadows. So with these early stages, I'm painting a little bit with my brush, painting a little bit with the airbrush and changing the opacity of the brush to kind of get different looks that I want. And these two give us that combo of that soft and hard edge. Another little sneaky tip for you and is what I did in this piece is I color picked uh, the colors for the face directly off another image because uh, nobody owns a color palette. So just thought I'd help myself out there and pick some realistic colors to work from. And as you improve at coloring and gaining experience, uh, you'll probably not even need to color pick anything from another image. You'll just be able to kind of pick by sight at this point. I just pick by sight for the rest of the painting. I don't really need to pull anything from an image anymore. So all we've done so far is just flat coloring along with some bulk shading, soft and hard edge shadows. And for the next step, highlighting is again a mix of soft and hard edges for those highlights. And we're not doing any blending yet. I'm not even at that stage. We kind of get a bit of a blending effect because we're using a hard edged and a soft edge brush. We will be touching more on blending in a moment, but I find because I'm using these two brushes for both shadows and highlights, I don't spend a huge amount of time doing a lot of blending, even in general for the whole piece. And that's just kind of my sort of process, my kind of style. So what I'm doing is paying close attention to my reference, carefully looking to see where there are these soft and hard edged highlights. And you can see on the right side of the face, there is that soft little highlight, a bit of a reflection highlight on that side. And lighting is interesting because it does reflective things. So pay close attention to those references. You know, lighting is a complex topic. And so while we're not masters at it, we can learn a lot and take away a lot just from looking at references. So at this point, I'm actually spending more time blending in combination with more brush strokes on the face. And the main blending brushes that I use are two different brushes. The first one is what I call a hard blending brush where the edges of it kind of end up harder mimicking. You can think of like a regular brush with hard edges. And then the opposite of that, a like an airbrush, it is a blending brush that's more like a blur. So I use a combination of this blur blend and also a harder edged blending brush so I can get the effect I want as they're kind of like opposites. 
And I'm not really one to color pick, where you color pick and paint and color pick and paint and color pick and paint as a method of blending. Not my preferred method. I just literally take blending brushes and blend. All right, and now we're getting into some of the good stuff. What is gonna make this look realistic? Well, one of the most important things we need to do is start adding red. So up until now, we've just used basic colors of our you know, supposed skin color. We need to start bringing in more colors to make this feel real, and I like to start with red. Red is an important color to bring in because of something called subsurface scattering, which has to do with light passing through skin and having that red glow. My little trick without needing to know a ton about the science of subsurface scattering is to put red where light transitions or where there might be thin areas of the skin where light can pass through, such as earlobes, fingertips, tip of the nose, that kind of thing, when direct light hits it. And then again, we can check our references and see where the red is on these references. In many ways, you don't have to know this stuff, you just have to be a good observer of a good reference image. But of course, learning, studying, and understanding color theory and why the skin is red, subsurface scattering, all that stuff, that's really going to help you. So spending time studying art and things like that is great. I'm self-taught, so I literally learned through things like YouTube videos. So it can be done. We can overcome getting through things that we don't know and don't understand with good observation skills, kind of like a fake it till you make it approach. Speaking of color theory, there is a lot to know about it, but as a general rule, we can again simplify how we approach it by thinking about this rule the rule that whatever your shadows are if it's cool or warm your light areas will be the opposite so in most cases the most common thing you'll see is your shadows are a cooler color like a blue or purple and then your highlight areas are a warm color like a yellow or even red so if you just remember that rule, you can bring in so much life to your artwork if you enhance those colors and that range of colors in just one bit. So you have skin and in that skin you'll find purples, you'll find yellows, that kind of thing. So adding an extra bit of blue and purple to your shadows and an extra possibly bit of yellow to your highlights. The next thing I did here to try and make this more realistic was actually soften up the intense darkness of the eye area and tone that back a little so that I could build it up again in a way that felt more realistic. So it's kind of like taking a step back and then I build it up from there. This whole art process and doing shading and coloring for these semi-realistic renderings are a lot of building up slowly over time. It takes a lot of time and coming back to an area repeatedly and bouncing around the image to keep refining and fixing and adding and sometimes taking away and then adding again to get it to a point of realism and that you only can sort of do by figuring it out as you go seeing how the image evolves so that you know what to kind of do next and of course if you're like i don't know what to do next well a lot of it definitely is experience and getting to know the feel for this kind of painting style so really my process has a lot to do with bouncing around the image coloring one area seeing how that affects the image as a whole or affects another area and then eventually I get to a point of I don't know how to continue rendering the skin until I see how the hair looks rendered and the other areas so that's ultimately one of the next things I do is okay now I need to see where the hair is at because the skin has been refined so much that I can't do more until I see how the hair looks in combination and even the background, etc. At this exact point in the artwork where I've slowed down here, I am adding little speckles onto the nose, cheeks, and chin area, some light ones for some shiny reflective sparkle feel, and then some dark ones that are more like a freckle sort of vibe. I actually ended up doing it a lot earlier in the stage of this artwork than I would normally recommend or would normally want to do. So a lot earlier because I guess there's still more to render. This is definitely more of a final touch sort of thing, but sometimes I just kind of get excited to add things and I just do it. These tiny dots create kind of a skin texture appearance. 
So at this point here, I'm actually taking purple and airbrushing it into my shadows and just deepening those cool colors in the face. I found that I didn't actually end up adding a lot of warm to my highlighted areas. I felt that there was already a sufficient amount of depth to the warmth. I could have maybe experimented adding a bit more yellow, but red does fall within the warm colors part of the color wheel. So I felt that in that case, um, as it was, it did feel warm enough. And especially given that this whole piece was definitely going in the direction of being a cooler piece with a lot more cool colors in it, it meant that while my cool colors needed to be more intense to feel cool, my warm colors didn't necessarily need to be as intense. And that's kind of just something to keep in mind is kind of where your whole painting sits on the color wheel. If there's a lot of cool colors, then a, a tiny bit of warmth is going to feel really warm. But if there's a lot of cool colors, you know, you're going to need a much more intense cool color for that to kind of like stand out. Now, some of this discussion, like what I'm talking about right now is probably complicated and confusing and it might just feel like, wow, that's beyond me. I hope it doesn't like freak you out. I mean, reviewing these concepts, coming back to them and thinking about learning about color theory is going to be valuable and it might make more sense later than it does right now. So take from this video bits and pieces. If everything doesn't make sense, that's okay. Things start to click over time. The more you kind of review and learn this stuff, the better you're going to be able to absorb it. It's going to sink in and you will actually just start doing some of it. You might not even realize you're doing it. You're just going to start doing it the more you learn and practice with the information. So here I go in and I darken the shadow under the neck. You can often go quite dark under the neck. I pulled the darkness from the darkest part of the face I could find. I wanted to make sure we were using the same range of values or the same levels of darkness to be consistent. So I wouldn't want to suddenly pull out a near black and put that under the neck. So I'm just being mindful of the range of the shadows and where I put our darkest shadows and making sure that the darkest dark is the same level of dark that I use for those areas. So it's, again, just being consistent. One thing I wanted to mention while I'm showing you part of the process of background and things like that is that you may or may not have noticed, but I am tweaking the eyes and the facial features, their size, placement, things like that throughout the process, throughout the creation of this whole image, those are being adjusted. And the main tool I use for that is the liquify tool. It's not something I really felt a huge need to mention as when we're focusing on skin rendering. I mean, that is a part of it because where the features go has everything to do with that. But I did want to make sure I mentioned it to you, the liquify tool for those features making those adjustments I think is an amazing tool. The thought process behind the liquify tool and when to use it is the same as pretty much all the other steps is I see a lack of something, something needs to be fixed. I can sort of see that my sense of art sight tells me that something is off with one eye. So I'm going to try and fix it. And then I can do a compare a before and an after. And so it's just developing your sense of art sight to decide if something needs to be fixed and then making the attempt to fix it. And sometimes these attempts don't work out and you just revert back to what you had. So at this point, you'll see that I go in and I adjust the tones. There is something called the tonal adjustment. So under the menu at the top, under layer, correction layer, uh, you can adjust from there. You can think of it like what filters do, like on Instagram, make the piece pop and it gives you control over how dark your shadows go and how light your highlights go and even the midtones. And I find this is a great tool to use in an artwork too. If your piece is looking a little flat, you can enhance the range of those values. Now I have done a video on values and it's a complex topic as well, but it has everything to do with realism and I go really in depth on it. So if you really want to learn more about like how dark your shadows should be and how light your highlights should be and how do you know if you're doing it right, then definitely check out that video. I'll put it in the top right uh, right now so you can see it, but it'll also be in the description for you to find at your own convenience. In the correction layers panel, there is also the option to adjust the color balance. So you can go 
in and adjust the range of the colors in the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. Again, whether that's going to be more cool, more warm, and continue with the idea of these cool, you know, colored shadows in this case and the warm highlights. And I was able to enhance that and play with the different looks again, like a filter. It's really cool to be able to make these adjustments at the very end and make your art like pop. It was a lot in this video. This was a lot. And if you want to learn a lot more, I've got more semi-realism art tutorials to come. I've got some on my channel right now, such as my how to paint realistic, semi-realistic hair. So again, that'll be in the description too. And I'll link that in the top right. I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you stuck it out to the end, congrats to you. You're on your way to learning a heck of a lot more and being able to apply it. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more videos from me similar to this, more to come and all that good stuff. All right, you guys have a great day. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.